today I would want us to have like an overview of the entire auditing paper, of the entire auditing paper. And to get us started, ladies and gentlemen, I would want a good student to define for us who an auditor is, who is an auditor. So there was pride uh, called uh, local. Um, but an auditor is someone appointed to independently examine the financial statements of an institution and give an opinion. I can't put it better. An examiner or rather somebody who has been appointed to give an independent opinion as regards to what? Financial statements of an entity. And then we are from George here is an, a person or a firm appointed by a company to execute an audit to execute an audit. That one, I'll be able to give you one mark out of two marks, George. Why? Because you have not brought out this issue of independence. Independence is a word that underscores the entire auditing function. Independent examination of books of accounts, independent examination of financial statements with what objective? An objective of giving an opinion as to whether these financial statements portray a true stroke fair view. Somebody here called Edward or Esther, Esther Paul, an auditor is a professional person who carries out an independent review of financial state to confirm if they are a true and a fair view. I'll be able to give you two marks there straight away. Two marks there straight away because what I'm able to get from this good lady is that uh, an auditor is independent and is coming out to give an opinion regarding what your financial statement. And of course, she has been able to tell us whether, or rather you'll be giving this opinion as to whether these financial statements portray a true and a fair view position of the firm. And then we have uh, Edward, a person who has uh, completed CPK. He must be a member of ISPAC, I like that. He must be a member of ISPAC. Authorized to review and uh, verify the financial statements and to give an independent opinion. I like how this gentleman has been able to understand the role of an auditor and that he has been able to coin in his own language a very good definition, a very good definition. And I even like it most how he's able to bring in the idea of this person being a member of ISPAC because ISPAC is the one that licenses auditors in Kenya here. Thank you very much. Is there any other that you need to read? I think those are enough. No, those are enough. Those are enough. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I would want a very good student again. Remember, you are doing what we call curtain raising. You are raising up the curtains for me so that someone now can come uh, to the show. To the show. How will you be able to tell that an, an auditor is independent? How will you be able to tell that an auditor is independent. Uh, I'm throwing the ball back to you live. Back to you live. Back to you live. The independence test. How will you be able to tell that an auditor is independent? Uh, ladies and gentlemen, an auditor can only be said to be independent if he's able to work on what you call the independence threats. The threats to who? To independence. If he's able to work on the threats to his independence, who is able to remember these independence threats? Independence threats, please check there. Independence threats, independence threats. Who is able to remember the independence threats? Independence threats. Independence threats without wasting time, ladies and gentlemen, you always remember them using this acronym, acronym of Mr. Safis, using the acronym of Mr. Safi. So I started by telling you that you should not take any note. If you feel that there is anything that I'm speaking about, that I'm talking about, which is valuable to you, which you would want in this case here to have down for future reference, don't shy away from doing that. Like this one, I think it's a very good acronym, an acronym of Mr. Safi. Kwamba auditor, lazima akuim Safi. Auditor, lazima apotrui kitu ya Safis. Surface. There are five of them. One, two, three, four, five. So the first one is self, what here somebody? Self-interest. Self-interest threat. 
that if an auditor has an interest in our organization, then this guy will not be independent. If, for example, today I'm the CEO of Safaricom, and then we want to appoint an auditor, an auditor to come and audit Safaricom Limited, and then we realize that this auditor has shares worth 20 million Kenya shillings. So he has a financial interest in our institution. There is no way in future he will say that uh, this particular farm, uh, Safaricom, is a bad farm. So every time he'll only be throwing kicks to one direction. Where will be tell, where will be telling the public that the Safaricom company is good, is good, is good. Every time he says it's good, of course the market will be responding by having the market price per share be what up there because of the demand of the company shares, which will go up, which will go up, which will go up. So whenever somebody has an interest, then straight away his independence is impaired. His independence is impaired. And then we have this A standing for what he are advocacy. We have this standing for familiarity. Familiarity. We have intimidation. 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 And then we have what we call self what here? Self review. We have what we call self review. Self, self review. Ladies and gentlemen, remember advocacy comes in so many ways. If, for example, you as our student has always been sharing our post, you always post on RCM, you always share. So meaning that eh, the public has already known your position. If it's Paris, for example, like you now Paris is doing a very good job for us online. So every time Paris, she, Paris, she sees our materials online, she always does what he shares, shares. So the public already knows that this person is an advocate. He is promoting our interests online and of course in other areas like that. So later on, after Paris finishes her CPAK, she becomes a distinguished great auditor and the RCM hires her services she will not be independent of us because in this case here the public knows that she took a position about what here rcm about rcm so once you take a position a position that is basically known that you guys every time you go outside there you are talking very closely about rcm later on after you come and the auditors and realize that you are doing crazy things at rcm and you want in this case here to qualify for example our report Chances are you will not qualify them. Why? Because what will even the market say about such kind of a qualification from a person who seemingly was a great friend of ours? I mean, advocacy is all about promoting our interest. If you have been promoting our interest, there, then our umbilical cords are tied. We are dependent on each other. You've been marketing us outside there, so we are dependent. We are connected somewhere. Familiarity, ladies and gentlemen, of course, this happens whenever you audit an organization for quite a long time. If you audit RCM College, say for 10 years, for 10 years, it doesn't matter how strict an auditor you are. It doesn't matter how independent you'd want, in these cases and gentlemen, to uh, portray yourself. Over 10 years, will have become family. Over 10 years, will have become like family. And the moment we become like a family, there is no way, ladies and gentlemen, you will ever come telling the public that RCM College is what is bad. So the more the time you stay with us, chances are, ladies and gentlemen, you will become a great friend. Familiarity threat will always be on you, on you. Then we have what we call intimidation, like some time back here, you saw what happened to some internal auditor at the Ministry of Health. She came and said that five billion has disappeared. And she was there, or rather the guy was there putting up names to people who may have stolen the money. And unfortunately, there was some family which was being mentioned. I'm telling you the kind of a threat that guy received. We even don't know where he is up to date. So that guy, it would have been automatically in his own interest to resign. Why? Because in the future, after such intimidation, after such undue pressure, there is no way you will ever be free 
to make an independent opinion. No way. No way. No way. So under intimidation, whenever you feel that the pressure coming up, perhaps somebody has come and told you, you, Mr. A, if you give us a bad opinion, look at this. I will shoot you. That is a new pressure. It means that, uh, of course, this life is good. Nobody will want to die. It means that in the future, as I make my decisions, I'll be making my decisions without fear. Fearing for my life. So in that case, you are always better off doing what you are going out of uh, such an assignment. You go out of such an assignment. And then we have the last uh, threat, which is a self-review threat. Review meaning means what here? Viewing your own work. Having to view a figure like twice. And that can only happen if you are the first one, for example, to generate a certain parameter. And then later on, you are being called to come and uh, perhaps audit the same. Listen and listen to me very well. Once you come here as an auditor, of course, at RCM College, if you have come in as an auditor, being an SME will, of course, recognize your talents as an auditor. Will you be able to know that this auditor, apart from auditing, he may be at a position of doing our tax parameter, doing our tax figures, and, of course, even filing the same with KRA. So here we are. We have engaged you to do our tax figure our tax computations. So after you do our tax computations, one thing that is for sure, the figure of tax you raise there will find its way in the financial statements, either as, or rather in the financial statement, in the income statement, or if the entire amount was not paid in the year, it will be approved in the statement of financial position. Now, ladies and gentlemen, when an auditor, rather when these financial statements have been completed, they'll be passed to the board of directors of the company. The board of directors will be able to approve them. Once they are, they are approved, they'll again be passed on to the auditor. Once the auditor receives the financial statements, remember we'll be auditing them in light of the assertions, in light of the assertions. Remember what we call the management who? Assertions, the management assertions. Remember the management assertions, they are normally nine. Management assertions, they're normally nine. We have what we call ACCA cover. ACCA what here? Cover. ACCA cover. Remember, an assertion, ladies and gentlemen, is a declaration. What the management is declaring, what the management would want the public to believe. So the management wants the public to believe that uh, the financial statements are what? Accurate. That uh, in this case, they have been able to capture everything that uh, occurred in the year within those financial statements. In short, that their financial statements are complete. So we have completeness, completeness. That they have been able to classify, classification, and of course, allocation of all the items uh, into their proper ledgers, proper accounts, proper accounts. And then, of course, we have the cutoff. Cutoff. We have occurrence. We have valuation. We have what we call existence. Existence. And then, lastly, we have what we call rights uh, under rule, obligations, uh, rights under obligations. So, these are the kind of things that the management would want to cheat us over, would want to cheat us on. So the management is telling us that we have prepared books of accounts that are complete, books of accounts that are what here accurate. And once these books of accounts have been passed on to an, a good auditor, this great auditor will wear what we call professional skepticism. Professional skepticism, Google's lenses, where he's supposed to doubt all these. Aha, uh -huh, where he's supposed to doubt all these what here. We're supposed to come and doubt all these assertions. And of course, try as much as possible to gather appropriate, sufficient audit evidence to be able to form an opinion on this. Now, listen and listen to me very well. The auditor, of course, upon being given these financial statements, like the income statement, when he looks at that sales figure, sales figure, he will do quite a lot of work. 
in this sales figure, a lot of work because he has never seen the figure before. He has never seen the figure before. So he gets, for example, all those, he'll do a lot of work on sales figure. Now he goes to cost of sales, again, he has never seen that figure before. He'll do a lot of work. He goes to the position, he'll do a lot of work. Along the way, this gentleman will come and there, lay his hands on the tax that he computed himself. So in short, he'll be reviewing his own work. Ladies and gentlemen, all of us tend to trust ourselves so much. Chances are he will not even apply any, any audit procedure in that figure that he computed himself. And even if he was to apply any audit procedure on that figure and he realizes that, that there is a problem, that there is a mistake he made, chances are he can't raise that mistake with, no, with anybody. I mean, who would want to embarrass themselves? So once you start doing so many other things other than the auditing work which took you there, automatically you can't exhibit the independence principle. You can't exhibit the independence principle. So in this case here for self-review, self-review, self-review as well there, after another trend. Once in this case here you start doing so many other things for this organization, your income will of course go beyond, beyond the threshold of 15%. And once your income from one client, your income from one client goes beyond the threshold of 15%, you will be said to be dependent on that company for your livelihood, for your livelihood. So in the future, if in this case here that client would want to cut ties with you, you will really cry. You will go down on your knees saying, hey, how will I survive? In the process, they will tell you, always be giving us a good audit opinion. So meaning that you are tied with that company, your umbilical cords are joined together. They are joined together. They are joined together. They are joined together. So ladies and gentlemen, here I've taken this opportunity to show you two great things. Number one, the threats to independence. And then number two, we have also looked at what you have called the assertions, the management assertion. When management gives us this financial statement, there is that belief that they would want us as the public to appreciate that we think that everything is okay. Even how they lay down those financial statements. I mean, they color them so well. If you're not so careful as an auditor, to use proper lenses, you'll not be able even to detect any mistake just by observation, just by observation. So you have to go through that particular thing, knowing that uh, in most cases, many managers will never do the right thing, will never do the right thing. Now, ladies and gentlemen, here we are. You've come here, Mr. George. That is Mr. George and Associates. We have given you a job at the RCM College to audit us. To audit us. So in this case here, we have even signed an engagement letter. We've signed an engagement letter with you. What will be the very first thing do you think will George and Associates do at RCM? Plan for the audit that is coming from who? Tina. Tina, yes. Plan for the audit. Planning. Planning. We must even know the strategy which you're going to use. I like that. Any other person who has a more ideas on the same. Getting background knowledge of the client who are the directors, etc, etc. Have entry meeting with the directors. I like that. Ah, you guys are so good in this subject. I even don't know why I'm here today. I think I should not even have come here to teach you today. You guys seem to be knowing everything. Assess the inherent risk. What kind of risk exist over there for us to be able to know which audit strategy are we going to apply? Which audit strategy are we going to apply? Nobody's talking about internal controls. Nobody's talking about internal controls. Understand ICS, understand the internal control systems. Yes, in terms of trying to get that background, doing the inherent risk assessment, ladies and gentlemen, it will be very important for us to come and there, uh, look at the internal control systems of the company. 
internal control systems of the company, ladies and gentlemen. Now, I would want to start, I want, uh, rather, I would want, uh, yes, to ask you a simple question. What are internal control systems? What are internal control systems before I give you what is required in that particular area? What are internal control systems? Now, my great students, if, for example, you want to protect your company, so we have the company there, we have the company there. This company of ours is being led by who? Directors. Directors. We may have come to Nairobi, a thousand people of us decided to contribute a million each one of us, and we raised one billion Kenya shillings. Okay. I'll leave them later. So now we have a resource, we have a fund of a billion Kenya shillings. But now the question is, these are thousand people really, can they stay in Nairobi to manage this new entity that you have developed? Can they stay in Nairobi to manage the new entity that they have developed? No. What they will do, ladies and gentlemen, is to come and appoint a few people, like say 10 of them, in the name of directors, to run the company's affairs on the behalf of what here, all the directors now, all the other shareholders will go home. Now, what do you know about human beings, I included generally? We are greedy. We, we, we prefer big things. We prefer big titles, big vehicles. So if you are not careful, these 990 people who have contributed and, 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 and went to home, if they are not careful, the 10 people who are left to run this company will squander everything. And that is why we need a third eye. A third eye to come and there, be inspecting what they're doing. And what we will do, first of all, as shareholders, will ask the directors to put up internal control systems. So internal control systems, set up, uh, setting up of internal control systems, is the sole responsibility of the management. It is the management that puts up internal control systems management so the management will come and they put some umbrella over their head so this umbrella that will ensure that our companies or other company is not being rained on by brains by brains is what we call the internal control system so in short internal control systems are those mechanisms that we put in place as an organization to ensure that a firm's objectives are met in the long run, are met at the end of the day. The major objective being profit maximization. So we need to put things in place to ensure that we are able to get our revenues, monies belonging to the company will come to the company, that all the expenses, for example, we have, have been genuinely in a card in the interest of the company. So we are putting the safeguards, the safeguards, safeguards to ensure that we are not being rained on. Remember the kind of rain that we are trying to talk about is rain, some of it, which will come from independent parties from outside. And the rain, in this case, here, some of the rain, bad rain, could be coming from these fellas. I spoke about greatness, these fellas, these fellas. So we need to protect ourselves 100%. Now listen and listen to me very well. How do I get to tell whether this umbrella is good enough? We can only say that this umbrella is good enough if we are able to have the objectives of the farm being met. And as such, we must talk about the objectives of good internal control systems who is able to give us the, the five objectives of ICS without looking at their notes. The five objectives of ICS. Five objectives of ICS. So the five objectives I'm being told there, number one, prevention of fraud and errors, uh, safeguard the assets of the company from fidelis. Thank you very much. We have uh, Paris Mumbi ensuring there is adherence to management policies. Uh, thank you very much. Mwaura Tina assessment of risk. assessment of risk. Ladies and gentlemen, if you want to remember 
All these things, very fast, the way Mwalimu is able to remember them. Always try to come up with your own mnemonics, with your own mnemonics, mnemonics like this, mnemonics like this, or acronyms. Like, for example, for objectives of ICS, we normally know that ICS normally comes to stop. We normally talk of a stop, a stop. You're going to get all the marks very easily. We normally talk of a stop, where A stands for accuracy, A stands for accuracy, S is safeguarding the company's assets, safeguarding the company's assets. Timely reports, timely reports. We have order, and then we have prevention. We have prevention, prevention of proud and error. Prevention of proud and error. Those are the five objectives of ICS. I can see you are talking about risk assessment, adherence to management policies, but believe you me, those are secondary. The main objectives of ICS, just look at your notes, are this, that if uh, ICS is very strong, we should be able to get accurate reports. If our ICS is strong, we should be able to get our company's assets being safeguarded, no thefts. There is no way, if there are internal control systems, there are no way you will get the governor, for example, taking uh, a company's or a county's vehicle to go and work for him out there for private business. No way. No way. So we have here reports on time, like as an auditor, when I want to query a few things here and there, I want any ledger, I should be able to get all the ledgers by just a touch of a button. If that happens, then the internal control systems of the company are very strong. And then we have got order. If I come to your organization and be able to tell whether the internal control systems of that company are strong or not, just by looking at the kind of filing systems that you have. Even if they're manual, I'll be able to tell. If, for example, I want anything from inside there, how fast? I mean, how organized are you? If you're not organized, if there is disorder, that's an indication of a poor or weak internal control systems. How even you create your files in computers. If, for example, something was to happen, God forbid, and you die, is there any other person who will be able to retrieve uh, management information from that computer? If no, then you are disorderly. You are disorderly. Straight away, there are no controls there. And then, of course, we have the last one, which is prevention of what here? Prevention of proud and what here? Errors. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I would want you to listen and listen to me very, very well. Listen and listen to me very well. When I come to your organization, of course, using these internal control system questionnaires, system questionnaires, internal control, ICS, ICS uh, evaluation questionnaires, I should be able to deduce the kind of internal controls that you have. If your internal control systems are very strong as an organization, then as an auditor, I'll have very little work to do. I'll have very little work to do. If your internal control systems are very strong, I'm not able to see where funds are being stolen. Ladies and gentlemen, what will happen is that I will place reliance on internal control systems, reports I get from internal control systems, and do very, very little work. For example, when it's sampling, I'll be doing small sampling. I'll be doing small sampling. If, ladies and gentlemen, it's about, for example, staying at the premises of my client, a client who has got very strong internal control systems, I can even decide to do final audit, end of year audit alone. Or if they are paying some interim dividends, I can go and uh, do an interim audit and then final audit. Now, what if in this case here I come and realize that this is your organization, so big like myself, but I decide to use an umbrella of a three-year-old kid. So a big farm, which has decided to put the internal controls like this, this small, this little. So it means that automatically the farm shoulders, all of them, everything, head, the shoulder, knees, and whatever, everything is exposed to thieves. We are exposing our assets. If that happens, ladies and gentlemen, then as an auditor, I will not place any reliance there. And if I not place any reliance there, ladies and gentlemen, now I have to do what we call substantial work. Substantial work, substantial work, substantial work, ladies and gentlemen, is what auditors call substantive, substantive test. Substantive coming from the word substantial. 
substantive death coming from the red substantial. So I know substantive tests are at times are applied at the very beginning planning stage. But you see now here, the moment I discover that your internal control systems are kaput, not working at all, now here I will go to what we call the test of details. The test of details. And these substantive tests, they are normally five. They are normally five. Who is able to remember them? The test of details are normally five. Who is able to remember them, ladies and gentlemen? Give me the substantive test there. Somebody talk to me tonight. Talk to me tonight. My one hour is almost over. My one hour is almost over. If you're not really engaging me, Mwari would want to go and disappear. And disappear. So you must engage me for me to be around. Even students who are following me on Facebook, please engage me over there. Engage me over there. Ladies and gentlemen, I don't know how among, or rather how many among us happen to be having young children, school going children, young children, perhaps between ages of four to say six, seven years they are. These are those people who will be going to classes and among the main things they will be taught will be the vowels, the vowels. Are you able to remember those vowels that we also sang sometime back when we were young in nursery school? Who is able to remember those vowels? They used to be five. Those vowels, they used to be five. Who is able to remember them? Who is able to remember them? Somebody in your comments that the vowels. We have consonants, we have vowels. Who is able to remember those vowels? Are they able to remember the vowels in uh, my comments there? Somebody, are they able to remember them? A, A, E, O, U. A, A, E, O, U. This basically, A, A, E. A, A, E, O, U. A, A, E, O, U. This one here basically will be my substantive tests, where R stands for analytical procedures, analytical procedures, analytical procedures. A stands for an inquiry, an inquiry, and a third party, an inquiry, and third party confirmations, an inquiry, and third party confirmations. And then we have in this case here, I standing for inspection, O stands for observation, observation and then we have you we have you standing for recalculation 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 and the performance recalculation and pre performance of course at least there is a you somewhere here so if your controls are not working i'll have to do quite a lot of analysis i'll have to apply the ratios so what I will do is to ask you to give me, say, financial statements for your company for the last five years. And then I'll be able to do the test of trends. If the sales revenue is growing and we have the gross profit margin decreasing, then I'll be able to raise an audit query. I'll be able to raise an audit, audit query. So we have here analysis, analyzing things critically because you decided, just like a madman, big man, using a child's umbrella. Then we have an inquiry and third party confirmations. So if you come and tell me that you had your receivables being 10 million, I tell you, fine, please place everything here. And after you've placed everything here, allow me to talk to those receivables, to those debtors directly for them to confirm their balances with us, uh -huh, of the company, with us as your auditors directly. So any queries and third party confirmations, when you tell me that this was the bank balance, I'll tell you, you know. Remember, you used a bank umbrella. You don't have any internal controls. I can't trust you. Let me talk to your bank directly. Then we have an uh, inspection observation. Yes, so many people confuse uh, between the two. What is the difference, somebody there in your comment section? The students who are on Zoom with us, RCM, online uh, students. Could you kindly try to give us the difference between inspection and observation. Even the students who are following me on Facebook tonight, could you kindly give me the difference between observation and inspection? Inspection means checking supporting documents in order to gain some level of assurance, in order to be assured. So you are checking documents. That is inspection. How about observation? So in inspection, for example, you could inspect ledgers, you will inspect in this case here books of accounts. How about observation is where now we use our eyes 
to see what is happening where we watch processes. For example, when they tell us eh, that uh, if it's at a CM college, that we have a soldier who is at the gate, who happens to ensure that every other student who goes inside RCM has paid the school fees. What I need to do as an auditor is to go outside there independently, pretend, uh -huh, and try, see, see whether for sure every other student who goes through the door, he checks that. He checks that. And in case any student has not paid there, uh, whether he stops them, ETC, 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 ETC. I like that. Now, how about recalculation? So if you come and tell me, ladies and gentlemen, that uh, we had our depreciation being 10 million Kenyan shillings, I'll tell you no problem because I don't trust you, Mr. CEO. Number one, give me a management representation on the truthfulness of this. So they sit down and write. Number two, give me the property plant and equipment, assets, movement, register, and then tell me the quality of use. I will recalculate myself. I'll calculate myself this figure, and then, of course, compare with the one that you got. If there is no material differences, I'll work with yours. If there are material differences, I'll call upon you to change. I'll call upon you to change. I'll call upon you to change. Now, ladies and gentlemen, we at least are okay with this. We are okay with this. Is there any student who has a question? 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 Can I continue? Now, ladies and gentlemen, as you're doing all this as an auditor, you are trying, in this case, ladies and gentlemen, to get an understanding of the company. You've done your planning. Here you are trying to collect evidence, knowing, for example, that uh, evidence that comes from outside parties is more reliable than evidence you get from internal sources, blah, blah. At the end of the day, what are you gearing up towards? You are moving towards making an opinion. You are, near, you are gearing towards, in this case here, writing an auditor's report. Remember, within the auditor's report, we shall be having an opinion. First of all, I would want you to know that we've got two types of auditor's reports. We have in this case here what we call and modify and modify. And then number two, we have what we call the modified. Now, a modified report is what most of you call and qualified is what most of you call unqualified reports. These are good reports. These are reports where you are telling the public that uh, the financial statements of RCM College portray a true and a fair view. Portray a true and fair view. So then I'm not going to modify. What I will do is simply to pick the report, which is provided in the International Standards on Auditing, the ESA. I pick it the way it is. The only thing that I will change is the name of the institution the day, and of course, the auditors down there put signature. So I'm adopting everything, and that's why we are saying that it is what here is unmodified. It is unmodified. But what if, in this case here, there are issues within RCM? If there are issues within RCM, then I'll come and issue what we call modified reports. Remember, modified reports, ladies and gentlemen, you as an auditor, you can only modify reports on two grounds. Number one, if the financial statements are erroneous. Number one, the first reason as to why we modify a company's report, a company's report, so modify. You can only modify a company's report, ladies and gentlemen, if the financial statements are erroneous, if the financial statements are erroneous, or if there is a limitation in the scope, if there is a limitation in the scope of who? Of an auditor. Limitation in the scope of an auditor. By the way, as I present this, especially given that it's a free class, you have to give me a chance to market our products. So we're giving you these lectures straight away from RCM College Stanbank House Branch, which basically is a training institution to register to offer CASNEB courses and the NEC, ADSAN certificate and diplomas. 
among the many things that we do, we produce books like these ones. Like now, this is what we call a revision kit, which goes for a thousand, which happens to be having uh, questions and the answers of the past exams of CASNEV. And then, of course, we have the study packs. The study packs have uh, the class notes, very good, well organized, 1,500 Kenya shillings for the study pack. And then, of course, ladies and gentlemen, RCM College, Stanbank House, has online Zoom classes where we only charge Kenya shillings 100 for this kind of a lesson. I mean, it can't get better. 100 Kenya shillings for this kind of a lesson, that is too good for us, too good for everyone. So that is what we would want you guys to go and preach outside there. Because as I told you, we would want to have an online community which even extends beyond these books. I've taught for so long, as I told you in some class here, I've taught for so long, ladies and gentlemen, and I always keep on asking myself, how comes you get student A getting outside there and they get a job where they're being paid like 400,000 a month? And then you get student B who does the PA, goes, for example, to KCA, does become accounting, goes to University of Nairobi, does, for example, MB accounting, still getting some job here which doesn't pay very well. Now, ladies and gentlemen, what differentiates, I can assure you, let me just take a minute. This is like our break. This is like our break. And don't feel like you're wasting your bundles. No, this is our break. What normally happens? CPA is a prestigious qualification. It is a qualification, if you happen to back it up with some soft skills, you can never, ever go wrong. And that is where you get somebody who has just done ATD. But because they know of this area of uh, soft skills, they are able to scoop good jobs with good salaries, just with ATD. Like now, honestly, how do you call yourself an accountant and yet you do not know advanced Excel? What kind of an accountant are you? You don't know how to search for information. If you're given a worksheet here with millions and millions of data, for example, if you're given a worksheet uh, of uh, EABL and you're not able to search for data from inside there very fast, what kind of an accountant are you? There is no, nothing you can do as an accountant, that's according to me and according to the experience that I have. If you're not good in advanced Excel, if you don't know the pivot table, if you don't know how to slice and dice, if you don't know the VLOOKUP and many other like the macros, if you don't know how to prepare very good dashboard tables, very good dashboard, you don't know how to do a very good dashboard, then as an accountant, ladies and gentlemen, really, you'll become a mediocre, uh, a mediocre. you'll be a mediocre accountant mediocre accountant. The moment you've got that, and then you come and, for example, add like a foreign language. And for accountants, you don't need even a foreign, do a, to do a foreign language for say at their whole year. No. Just three months, get to know the numbering system, get to know how to translate financial statements here from Chinese to English. And then you get yourself very serious consultancy work at the KRA and the many other institutions. So it's all about how you differentiate yourself. And these are the kind of things that I would want us there eh, to get connected to get connected so that we can know how to help each other uh, and shine in the near future. This thing of sitting somewhere, saying that uh, CPA is a bad cause, people are, what have you done yourself in these cases and gentlemen really to deserve a heavy Pakistanis? Most of us are not doing anything. These are the kind of people that uh, even if you have to give them an audience of 200 years to speak to, they can't stand before a crowd. And yet they know that uh, accountancy you know, is all about reporting. And they're not doing anything about their public speaking abilities. I mean, I'm, I'm so sure I must have uh, stepped on somebody's toes. And that is why I would want us there uh, to continue. We continue with this. Are we, are we together, somebody? Are we together? Are we there? Are we there? Are we together? 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 Thank you very much. So what have we said here? We have said that uh, you can only modify your report as an auditor if the financial statements of an entity have errors or if there is a limitation in terms of what your scope. Now, ladies and gentlemen, come here very fast. We have uh, our various uh, forms here. We have what we call single or just material. And then we have uh, what we call pervasive or plural. Pervasive, so big, pervasive. Now listen and listen to me very well. I've come to audit RCM College. 
I realized that the sales is okay, cost of sales is okay, it's only depreciation in the entire, for example, financial statement, which has a problem. So once I realized that it's only the depreciation, which has a single item, a single item, what I will do, I will come in an error, single error, I'll come and issue what you call an accept for qualification. I will come and issue an accept for qualification. So what I'll be telling the public is that uh, the books or other financial statements of RCM portray a true and a fair view. They portray a true and a fair view, except for the fact that uh, their depreciation has been misstated by this amount, except for, except for. When you have one item which has an issue. But now, ladies and gentlemen, let me ask you a question. What if you come to audit RCM college and then you realize sales is wrong? We have cost of sales is wrong. Depreciation is wrong. Tax figure is wrong. Will you go ahead and tell the public that RCM's financial statements portray a true and a fair view except for sales, except for cost of sales, except for depreciation, except for, you will call the auditor, Mr. Except for. When we have these errors becoming one or two, ladies and gentlemen, plural or passive like that, what we shall do is to come and issue what we call an adverse opinion. You issue an adverse opinion where basically you advise uh, the public that RCM's uh, financial statements do not portray a true and fair view. They don't portray a true and fair view. They don't portray a true and fair view. The same case, ladies and gentlemen, with the limitations uh, of the scope of the auditor. Remember, once we have signed that engagement letter, the auditor becomes so big, so big. He should be all over, he should be all over. If he wants board minutes, there is no way you will tell him that you can't get access to board minutes because you have, no, 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 you must be given. So once you have signed the engagement letter with the, the auditor, ladies and gentlemen, you, you may want to apply his auditing procedures in whatever, so long as it's a legal thing, of course, eh? Yeah, and there's no way you will come and curtail his operations. If you try telling him that eh, you can't get this because of this, then you are limiting, you are squeezing his space, you are limiting his operations. Now, ladies and gentlemen, this auditor has come to RCM College has come to RCM College. He has done a good job. He's done a good job. Every time he came to us, we were very cooperative. Apart, for example, from one area, like stock tech, where he really wanted to attend, but he could not attend. And remember stock tech, like for RCM, stock tech over our, to us, stocks are very material. Eh? Service industries, normally, we don't have so much stocks, chairs, etc. So if that is the case, only one area, then what I will do is to come, anytime we are talking of single, we'll come and issue an except for, an except for qualification. So you qualify, to qualify is to talk about the that, which is there, to qualify. You're talking about the that which is there. So what you'll do is to tell the public that the financial statements of RCM portray a true and a fair view, except for the fact that I was not able to attend stock tick. Except for the fact that I was not able to attend what year? Stock tick. So except for, except for, you must state the reason for the qualification. So you are basically giving a good report, but drawing the attention of the users of the financial statement to this one thing that was not done properly. The one thing that was not done properly. And then we come here, this person has come to audit the company, right? So when it comes all of that, Everybody, upon him reaching, for example, the first floor of Stanbank House, where RCM is situated, you'll always get all the employees running away, helter-skelter, to all different directions, leaving the auditor stranded at the middle. So at the end of the day, remember an auditor does what? He forms an opinion based on the evidence, evidence they are receiving. So if there is nobody who is willing to give this person any evidence, honestly, as an auditor, what will you do? Honestly, as an auditor, what will you do? Others will walk into an institution. On reaching there, you are told this guy is the chief finance officer. The guy in this case here looks at you, of course, uh, 
in an annoying manner because auditors and accountants they don't like each other, don't understand why. And then he takes you by the side and tells you, you know what, young auditor, our account department got burned down last year. So there is nothing, no single ledger will give you. Just get out of the back of your mind. So it means at the end of the day, ladies and gentlemen, remember, as an auditor, I'm not supposed to cook my own things. I'm not supposed to fix anything of my own. My work is to form an opinion, an opinion depending on the kind of evidence I will collect. If there is no evidence to be collected, I'll be very factual to the public and tell the public that hey, I was not able to form an opinion. So in short, I'll be able to issue what we call a, discla a disclaimer of opinion. I'll be able to issue what we call a disclaimer of opinion. A disclaimer of opinion. A disclaimer of opinion. A disclaimer of what here? Yeah, opinion. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I would want us straight away to look at some past paper questions. Like if you look at May 2017, question number 5A. May 2017, question number 5A. Do we have our past papers there? Do we have our past papers there? Do we have our past papers there? So that is uh, May. If you have this book, you simply go to page number 182. RCMs, Revision Kits, Auditing and Assurance. You simply go to page number 182. Number one, or rather state the opinion you would give in each of the following situations. Number one, the books of the client were taken away by the regulator for investigation and were not available for audit. What kind of opinion would you give there, ladies and gentlemen, as an auditor? A disclaimer of what here? Opinion. A disclaimer of opinion because at the end of the day, you'll not be able to get any evidence like that. So Roman 2, Roman 3, Roman 4, I expect you to do those questions and post them in our WhatsApp. They're very easy. Like now we have Roman 2. The provision for doubtful debts was not adequate. The debtors in the financial statement were misstated, but the financial statement gave a true and a fair view. Only one item. Only one item. And you can see at the end of the day, the financial statement gave a true and a fair view. Eh? Only one item. So in this case here, only one item, what we'll do is to give an except what here for. An except for. Since the financial statement present fairly, other than the misstatement of what here the debtors, which may not be what here material. But like now, if you look at Roman 3, I would want you to go and look at Roman 3 very well. And then we discuss about it. I don't have to do everything as your teacher. Like look at May 2017, question 3A. Explain the following term as used in auditing. Emphasis of matter paragraph. Emphasis of matter paragraph. When do we make use of this emphasis over matter paragraph? Remember, we normally use emphasis of matter paragraph in situations where we are giving an qualified opinion. We are giving a good opinion that the client has been able to follow all the IFRSs. Everything is okay. But in this case here, even after following all that, if we have some unusual event, an event when crystallizes, when it crystallizes, we may even have our going concern status, ladies and gentlemen, being affected. Then what I will do is to come and emphasize a matter that the directors have been able to pick even their notes. You know, I can't emphasize a matter that the directors have not picked. So the directors must have picked them. The directors, for example, may have said, fine, you have done our financial statements very well, everything is okay, but we don't foresee ourselves being there in the next 12, year, uh, 12 months from today. So then as an auditor, as I'm going through, of course, given that they have met every technical issue, I'll give them a true, or rather I will give them an qualified opinion. But now I need to come and emphasize down there. Tell the public that uh, under emphasis of matter paragraph, that uh, as per note number seven, uh, specified by the directors, the company's going concern is like that. Right? Bankruptcy of a major client. If, for example, the company has owned up and they provided for that particular bad debt, bad debt, they have owned up, they know. Even in the notes to the account, they have said that this person was gone under. 
he's become bankrupt and he owes us this much. So this amount is at risk. So what I'll do as an auditor is to go ahead and issue and qualified opinion. But at the end of the day, because I know so many of these stakeholders don't even have the time to go and study the entire financial statement, but they always get time to look at my report as an auditor. What I'll do is to go there, in my opinion, introduce a new paragraph called the emphasis of matter, and I'll be able to raise that issue uh, with them. If you look at May 2016, describe four types of audit opinions that an auditor could issue. And this paper is quite a simple paper. It's not even a paper that we should be discussing with you. And they keep on repeating the same thing. Look at November 2017. It's another question that I want you guys to do as a, a homework. November 2017. You are the audit manager in charge of uh, audit of Lenga Limited. You have come across the following matters which you consider to be material. Explain how you would report each matter in the audit report. Number one, a major customer owing the company a substantial amount has filed for bankruptcy. There is no provision for this in the financial statements. If they had provided adequately for this customer who has gone bankrupt, then I would have issued what we call emphasis of matter paragraph. But now here there is disagreement between the directors and the auditor. Why? Because these guys have refused to provide for a customer who has gone bankrupt. And I've been able to keep on pushing these directors. Please make adjustments. Please make, because you know, as an auditor, you just don't go and issue an opinion without involving the directors. You must involve them. Try to show them the consequences. Tell them that uh, if you fail to do this and this, this is how my opinion will be affected. So, but it's very interesting. Who come on, ski? Would you have a opinion gani? Would you have a opinion gani? Would you have a opinion gani? I like normally going through uh, this kind of, uh, uh, of a statement here, which are normally written by my students. And that's why I would want you to, the students who are following me on Zoom, the ones who have paid at the same college to watch these things. I would want you to go straight away and look at this. Just present answers, and then we shall be able to discuss them. We shall be able to discuss them. Ladies and gentlemen, if you don't mind, I would want to call this class off. And of course, you promised to evaluate Mwalibu here in terms of audit, especially for those students who are doubting that I could not teach the paper, that I could not step in for the teacher. Have I not added value to your lives? I'm waiting for feedback as I sign off, as I run away. Is there any student, for example, uh -huh, are they giving us feedback? Value added, thank you very much. Thank you very much, value added, value added. Thank you very much, we're waiting. It was awesome, thank you very much, uh, great. Value added, and I believe that each one of us in this case here, even the ones who are watching us on WhatsApp, I expect you guys to sign up. Thank you very much, Kenneth Macharia, for following and uh, at least appreciating the work. Appreciate the work, thank you very much. Uh huh. Value added, uh, lots of value added. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, please don't forget to market these Zoom classes. Just get out of your way, try as much as possible to bring uh, many students on board, get our WhatsApp link, share it to various groups where you belong, bring many on board, and then we shall be able to afford the very best lecturers. Even myself, I don't have a problem with teaching you these papers, but you see, I can only teach you these papers if you are able to pay me very well, like the AFM class, where I get like 150 students, I mean, and each is paying me 100. I feel nice, I feel nice. That is the level that I would want this AA also to reach. Once you reach like 80, 70 students, then I should be able to come and step in and summarize this entire subject for you in five lessons. Five lessons. Five lessons. Because you see what I've done, I've mastered the acronyms. The acronyms, all of them. If, for example, today you tell me, audit sales for us. I know how to do it. Very fast. Very fast. I don't need more than five lessons to clear this subject. So, but now, for me to take it up, it depends on you. 
you must bring so many people and then we agree for five lessons we clear the entire thing otherwise uh, god bless you